so this morning you're going to uh, hear a lot about this um, scattering equations and between two strings. Um, and this, so first I'll talk about uh, work that is now almost two years. Uh, I think so. With uh, David Spinner and Tim Adamo on a generalization to, <coughs> to one group for the scattering equations. Using the ambitious thing, right? So, on the first day here, Dave gave a, a, a review of how to get the scattering equations from the ambitious string at three level. Uh, so, I'm just going to start by very, very quickly recapping, reviewing what he did, and then how the then I'm going to uh, tell you how the, the how using the formalism of the, the ambitious string this this worksheet model. You can have a very good guess. It just gives immediately what is what will be the one loop scattering equations once you put this model on a torus. Uh, Going to discuss I mean, the geometrical meaning and the behavior of, um, on the boundary of the model space, which is it's very important at three levels, very important one loop, and talk a little bit about well what we can and cannot do with them, and then. And then Yvonne is going to come and talk about a different, slightly different prescription that started with this one, but it's a modification of this one. And it's actually, I think it's very exciting now. It's very interesting, right? So, <clears throat> so well, first a tree level. So just a review of the tree level one. So the amputation string, there's an action. I'm just going to write the bosonic part of it, and then we we'll talk about the fermions later. The field P, space-time index mu, now the field X, uh, minus Lagrange multiplier, P squared, over two. Uh, and to be well-defined, well, to give graph amplitudes, there's more fermions we have to add here, but I'll discuss this later. Um, <coughs> So why do we call this the ambitious string? Well, it's because we, if you look at P and X as coordinates for my target space, so as coordinates on the target space, then <coughs> what, what this constraint is doing, this, this integrating out this field E is imposing the constraint that P squared is zero. And that's more or less the definition of the ambitious space in, in any number of dimensions, D. So, well, as Lionel was telling us uh, you know, yesterday, I think, or before, that ambitious space can really be seen as the contingent uh, space restricted to P squared equals zero, and then you have to mod out by the Hamiltonian vector field for this, for this Hamiltonian P squared. So we said P squared. So that's morally what this action is doing, is really restricting your target space to be ambitious or space, and hence the name of, of the model. Now, uh, without any insertions of vertex operators, we can just naively do a BRC quantization and, and, and pick a gauge where E is zero. And that's the end of the story, if you don't have any vertex operators. But once you have vertex operators, um, you cannot achieve this gauge uh, naively because E has modelized, right? So, um, <clears throat> so this, uh, on, so only uh, without, without vertex operators. Okay. So, so if I so if I do the usual BR sequentization, I add in this case I add some something like a B field, a B tilde, the bar C tilde, they are both fermionic fields for this gauge symmetry. Uh, there's some other fermionic symmetries which I won't be talking about now. And from this you get a BRST operator, which I'm also gauging usual. Worksheet gravity, so there is a stress energy tensor and a usual 
C goes. There is a C tilde. The C tilde goes for the constraint P squared, and <coughs> and some other bosonic center. So this this is the one I'm going to focus more on it. Right. So fixed vertex operators in this theory looks something like this. Um, tilde epsilon dot psi and epsilon dot psi tilde. So this is the pair of fermions that come here in the action. So I have also two real fermions in this action. So, and they are crucial for anomaly constellations in this theory. Um, <coughs> Here, this is just the usual C and C tilde insertions for this, uh, for this to, to soak up zero modes of, of the C, C ghost. These are the fermionic ghosts for a fermionic, something like a supersymmetry on the worksheet, and then an E, K, dot X. Uh, one important point is to notice since the action is, well, at least in this gauge, the action is free, and it is first order on P and X. There is no X, X, or P. There is no x axis of p, which means that this that the exponential doesn't have any conformal weight. So contrary to the string, where the exponential can have some, some different conformal weights, here it has zero conformal weight. So and that's basically what restricts the spectrum of the theory to be only the massless modes. And really, what tells it that this is these are the only vertex operators that I can write down. There's nothing else I can write down the theory. Okay. Now, if I do a gauge fixing, <coughs> gauge fixing procedure in the presence of vertex operators for this action, when I find that I cannot set E to zero because it has modulized now, I can set E to zero up to some moduli, and that was what, I'm not gonna go through this calculation again uh, that David did in the beginning, but the end result is that if you, go, if you do it very, very, very carefully, you find that on this, on, uh, <coughs> you have to, on the path integral, it appears some insertions of delta functions of, oh, let's see, the integrator of the order sheet. There's some Beltrami differential, differentials i, and they are here, they just contracted to p squared. <coughs> so you, you get an insertion of one to n minus three of this. So you get n minus three insertions of these guys where MIs are just, it's a basis of Beltrami differentials. Right. Um, and you can pick a basis such that the end result of this, it is really just, um, it, it amounts to just taking a, a residue uh, of this P squared. So these delta functions really are enforcing that the residue at the points ZI, where, uh, <coughs> where is, which ZIs are the insertions of the vertex operators of P squared is zero. So this is, this is the content of this, just doing this gauge fixing properly. And what else? And we're almost there, the scattering equations. So the other thing you can do is each vertex operator comes with an insertion of this exponential. You can, you can uh, <coughs> absorb that exponential into the action. So the action is p d x. Now you absorb the exponential into the action you have uh, I equals to one to n, ki delta z minus zi. And then you integrate the non-zero mode of x, and that imposes that the p obeys this differential equation, p of z is just the sum of ki z minus zi. And then on this sphere, there is only one solution. There is, I mean, there is a solution for this, the unique which is that P of Z is just, oh, sorry. I already wrote the solution here. So 
this is, this is, this is the delta Z minus ZI. Right? And this gives a solution that P of Z is just Z minus ZI. And <coughs> once you square it, so P square of Z is just a sum J not equal to I, let's say, Ki dot Kj, Z minus Zi, and Z minus Zj. You notice there is no double pole here. There are only simple poles. <coughs> because all the external momenta is on shell. So there is only simple poles. This is a quadratic differential with only simple poles. And if I take the residue at some point i, set i, say of p squared, then what I get is j uh, not equal to i, k i dot k j over z i minus j. And setting this to zero, which is what the delta function is, is doing, gives me the <coughs> scattering equations at real level. Yeah. You're probably jumping ahead, but uh, you're probably going to generate offshore right, at some point later for, for later purposes. Will you ever consider a case where it does it slide to zero? Not external momenta. No, no, no. no. External momenta is always, is always on shell in, the, in this thing. Um, so, scattering equations are never modified. They always stay the same. Uh, so, depends on what you want to say. So, what, the point is that what this whole procedure is doing for you, uh, this gauge fixing is doing, is really setting P squared, this field P squared to zero, everywhere on the, on the world chip, right? So if I say, if I take the definition of the scattering equations, this, then they are never modified. That's, that's what you're always trying to, to impose everywhere. Uh, so, so really, it's, it, now to do, go to one loop or higher loops, if you wish, it's nothing else than just defining the model at one loop, doing the gauge fixing procedure uh, as David did very, very carefully, and you see what comes out of that. Uh, but the external momenta is always, is always on shelf. I think uh, there have been some uh, massive scattering equations on the literature, but I think uh, they are all some dimensional reduction, reduction some uh, higher dimensional ones, much less ones. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. So, some generalities about these scattering equations. We, we know, well, you have n minus 3, but you have n marked points, but they are actually, it doesn't really matter which one you take out of them. There is an, an action of SL to C on them. So if they're really permutation independent. They, they are only n minus 3 independent ones. Um, you have, uh, for general kinematics, we know the number of solutions to them. It's n minus 3 factorial number of solutions. So it's a quite big number for when once the, you have more and more uh, points. Um, <clears throat> but they are rational, and you, you can still deal with them in a computer in a more or less straightforward way. And they are, of course, the, the backbone for the CHY formulas, uh, which for massless scatterings, which they take some, uh, in general, they take a form, let me just write down, as some integral over these are i's. I take i one two n. There's there's a um, quotient of by s l to c. Then you have here the scattering equations. As you do that i squared, and then you have here some integral which depends on the series uh, that you want. Right, so now, as of a couple of, a few weeks ago, we know, well, CHY put out a paper where now they know this integrand for several different theories, not only gravity and young mills as they had before, but also nonlinear single models, VBI, and et cetera. And, but for gravity in particular, what this is, is just a copy of two Fafians, we call Fafian M, or Fafian prime, and a Fafian prime. 
Um, and this fraction really just comes from the sign psi children from the model. Well, from doing, yeah, from doing the correlation functions of this, uh, this vertex operators. Straightforward. Right? So, let me just keep discussing the patients here. Um, one, of the, one of the most important uh, properties of the scattering equations is that you can see them as uh, they tie up, uh, so they, they, they tie up uh, the space of Lorentz in, uh, Lorentz in variance. space to the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. In, in a very particular sense, such that whenever I have, for example, a, a set of momenta, so if I have an n-particle scattering, so I have n external uh, momenta, and I pick a subset of this momenta that is going to zero, then this factorization channel is associated to the boundary of the model space. So let me write this as the boundary of the model space uh, genus zero and n match points in a very particular way. So for example, you have my sphere, and I have n mark points on the sphere. You just imagine I, I roll down n crosses, mark points. And let me say that I take some of them, I'm colliding to the point n. So let me do a change of coordinates. There's some parameter Q that controls this generation and some new coordinates UI. Doing this for I from M plus one dot M minus one. So I'm picking a subset of, um, of momenta and I'm colliding all of this, all of them. Let's say this is the N. I'm colliding some of them to the N. With, with some parameter Q controlling the degeneration. And what you can do is that just by picking up the first few scattering equations and a few algebraic manipulations, it's, it's really not hard to see that. What happens in this case is that at Q goes to zero, you have, you watch it, uh, is starting to degenerate, starting to create a zero point, where you have M particles here, M points here, you have the other points here, you have here, you have the M plus one, the dot to M points. And the scattering equations tells you that the moment associated with this point, so the moment K1 plus K2 dot dot, dot plus KM, you square it, and you can see that this is proportional to Q. So really, once you go all the way to the degeneration point here in, in Q is zero, and then you have really, you, you degenerate completely, then you, you, your scattering equations really do factorize into scattering equations for a set of momenta K1 to Km, and another set of momenta here, right? And it's very, and it's really, really, this, this off shellness of this momenta is really parameterized by this model of parameter close to the boundary, right? So that's how the scattering, and, and this, is, this is general. You can pick any set of, of momenta and play this game because the boundaries of this model space are quite simple. They're all like this. And you can see that this is just generic. This is just generic uh, behavior for them, right? Um, so, this, so that's how they know about right, factorization channels and poles of the amplitudes at three level. And you expect then that uh, scattering equations, any, any positive uh, scattering equation at one loop should also have some similar behavior with respect to the boundaries. So you should 
tie up some spatial largeness invariance to the boundaries of, in this case, a genus one Riemann surface. Right. I have a question. Yeah. Is it possible to compare the number of minus star invariants with appropriate numbers in the modeling space size? The dimension of modeling space is n minus three, uh, so it's smaller than the number of minus star invariants. Yeah, but the minus star invariants also have momentum conservation to. Uh, so, so they're not independent. Do you understand the, how the numbers compare? Yeah, I think I think the point is that for any, um, if you pick any set of monosome invariants, they're going to look something like this. To any set like that, I can associate a boundary of the modular space where this set is, uh, where this set of momentum is going on shell. Well, I don't mean going on shell. I mean the general situation where you just have a bunch of momenta, you have a set of monosome invariants, and out of those, you get uh, n minus three. Oh, no, that I don't know, actually. Yeah, uh, like specific solutions or uh, uh, how this counting goes? How, how the numbers compare? Does anybody understand this? Uh, what's, what's the total number of uh, minus 10 variance for m momentum? Independent, independent variance. How many numbers ah, do you need I see. Okay, numbers to, to, to specify, to characterize m on shell momentum? So one loop. Okay, so what one loop entails? Well, the action is the same, of course. I'm not going to change. Let me just rewrite here. P squared. It's probably a minus sign. True. Now the only thing I want is to define everything on a torus, right? So here's the definition of a torus, which you give me here with some mark points. So the big difference now is that there is a model parameter tau, which, com which um, really controls the shape of this torus, right? And <coughs> if you remember that we, in the Q, which is somewhere up there, we, we were gauging, sorry, this is a children. We were gauging worship gravity. So we, you expect that there's going to be an integral over the tau, but that integral is only going to be over the, the fundamental domain of this, of tau. Right. So now we're not gonna, so now the modular space is, is, has more structure. Not only do you have the positions of uh, the insertions of the vertex operators, you also have uh, <clears throat> this model like tau that has, that has to come into play somehow into the scattering equations, right? So <clears throat> you, you basically just redo the same, um, this, uh, the same uh, games we, we play at three level. You do a proper gauge fixing of the constraint now uh, you have to be careful because now E, because you are in a higher genome surface, E has more moduli, so there's more uh, insertions of equations, but in the end, you do the proper gauge fixing, so. And if you want to know the details, you either see Dave Stomp, or we can talk later about it.
proper gauge fixing is going to set, is going to give me an insertion of n scattering equations. So n delta functions of this form. Same thing as three level. And where mu is again just basis of a Beltrami differentials. But uh, one loop, I have n of this uh, Beltrami differentials, right? <clears throat> so, and that that is the same number of moduli for a genus one Riemann surface, right? <clears throat> so it's, the counting is simple. You have if you if you put n mark points, you have a, an action of translation here that takes that gives you n that gives you then n minus one moduli. One point you can always fix, fix by using this translation. Then you have another moduli for the shape of the surface. And that gives you in, then uh, n moduli for an, for a genus one Riemann surface with n mark points, the same number of scattering equations. But you're gonna see that already from this counting, you see that uh, there's something different about the tau moduli and that's going to be reflected on the, on the scattering equations. Right. So we can again so we can again pick a basis where n minus one of these uh, equations here. They just give me uh, the residue of p square and the mark points. Sorry. So this is the residue that I p square, just like a three level. Uh, <clears throat> and then and now the other one, the last one, you can pick a basis such that this just gives me simply p squared at some point, let me call this f naught, zero, All right? So what this is really, really, really telling me that uh, I'm, I'm killing some of the residues of the quadratic differential p, and then I'm setting it to be zero at, at one specific point. Um, if I forgot to tell you at first, but p is always is a section of the canonical bundle, so p squared is a quadratic differential on the Riemann surface. So if you do the, if, uh, now you can do the same thing as you've done, you've done at three level, you, you put your, you have n vertex operators, you absorb this n vertex operators into the action, you integrate out x, so from the px path integral, in the presence of vertex operators, so with uh, vertex operators, you integrate out the non-zero modes of x, and that sets, again, p of z is sum of ki, delta z minus zi. But then, <clears throat> the things are now because we are a genus one surface, uh, P has a zero mode. This has a homogeneous solution to the equation. So the most general solution for this equation is genus, genus one is P of Z. There's some zero mode. I'm gonna write this L, Z, plus sum of Ki. I'm gonna write this as, let's place this same notation as in the paper, Z minus Zi, tau, where S, one minus that i is that well yeah let's say like this tau this is let me just put this here specifically this is just d dz of g where this is the propagator for a bosonic uh, propagator for a free boson on on the on the torus. But the, <clears throat> the important property of this is that it has a simple pole when uh, z and zi, when the 
when the atoms that I collide, and that's that's the final characteristic of that. So, Kirill, as you ask, so now this the thermal meta is on shell, but this there's nothing that says that this is off shell or anything like that. And and more moreover, uh, because there's the zero mode, uh, I still have the zero mode of the p field to to, to integrate. So there's going to be a pure and explicit integration of uh, over this L, which we are going to interpret as as a, a loop momenta for the loop amplitude. Right. Now. Uh, again, if I square p, p squared, you see, if I, I square it, there's not going to be any double poles because, again, everything, um, the moment I start, moment is on shell. So th this is just, let me write down, it's, it's L squared. Well, there's a dz squared plus minus L dot ki. That I now plus j not equal to i, then i dot kj s to the one that minus that i and s to the one that minus that. Now. So yep. the is yes. Try with this. So I want you to keep this up. So <coughs> you have the okay. So basically, we had this differential equation, which is the same as in the three level, but now. Where one loop, you solve, it's simple to solve, there's the solution, you square it, and there is no double pole, any possible double pole is vanishes because the external moment is on shell. And now you basically just look at what the, uh, what this, what the model tells you are the scattering equations, and you just take the residues of these guys. So you just take a residue for that equation and you find <coughs> you have n minus one equations, which are so these are the z residues of p squared, and these are L dot ki uh, plus sum over i dot kj j equal to i that i minus a j tau. And <clears throat> you have one equation, which is p squared at some point and not equal to 0, which is that. And I'm not going to rewrite all of that. But the point is that uh, you can use momentum conservation. You can show that. So these equations are localizing the, you can think about them as localizing the positions, the mark points on the torus. Uh, and you can use momentum conservation to show that actually it doesn't matter which, which equations. It's just like a true level. It doesn't matter which set of the n minus 1 or out of the n equations you pick. Uh, only n minus 1 of them are, are really independent. The, so n minus 1 of them implies the last one of them. Uh, and you can use this n minus 1 equations to show that this last equation here doesn't really depend on which point the knot uh, I inserted. So the interpretation is really that you have this quadratic differential P squared that we want it to set to zero everywhere on, on the Riemann surface. 
So to do that, you kill its, if you kill n, it has n simple poles, doesn't have any double poles, you kill n minus one of its simple poles, so automatically the last pole, the last, uh, the last, the residue on the last pole is zero, it's not there, uh, but it still has a homogeneous component that you still have to kill, and that's the, that's the equation that kills the homogeneous component, and that's why it doesn't depend on, and the homogeneous component is just a constant mode, so that's why it doesn't depend on, on the point of the insertion, right? Um, so in a nutshell, these, these are what, what we call the one loop scattering equations. And really what they are enforcing, they are this, it's just, uh, they're just equivalent to enforcing P squared Z for <coughs> every point on the torus and for every torus. Right? That's what's important on the fundamental domain. Right? Any questions? So, see, once you have the, once you have this machinery of, of the MB twister string, it's, it's really simple. You just use like this usual, this old tools of string perturbation theory to just do the proper BRC quantization and, and, but almost for free, you just get the scattering equations, uh, this generalization to the one loop. Now, one thing that we can immediately study is the behavior of the scattering equations of this one loop scattering equations close to the boundary of the moduli space. Right. How easy is this to solve this question? Very hard. Well, it, it, you can put in the computer, there is a few, it, it's, it can be done numerically. Uh, for general, I don't know any solution for general kinematics. I know a few solutions for very specific kinematics. Um, yeah, but numerically you can, like even mathematics can more or less work with them uh, uh, for very low points, for, like four How points. Um, that's an open question. I, I, I think at, at four points there's, well, either one or two depending on how you count, you want to count them, but it's, it's, it's still an open question on how, how many solutions. Um, yeah. So we, we don't numerics for four points and five points at most, but yeah, it's, it's never, there's an issue with modular invariance we can discuss later that makes the counting a bit more subtle. Um, <clears throat> but while we're just working with, with this, we can look at uh, um, the boundaries of, uh, of the modular space. And my points, <clears throat> there, are two, there are two kinds of boundaries. There's a, um, a separating degeneracy, which is simple. You start with my torus, and I collide some of the points, just like a tree level. I, I choose some points to collide, and what happens is that I split off a sphere out of this, uh, out of these points that are colliding, they, they start to go to one point and this is conformally equivalent to splitting up a sphere and you're keeping the torus. And, <clears throat> and this is more or less the same calculation you can do uh, at three level or you can do more of a, um, a like a, it's just uh, <clears throat> factorization to CFT, that is just a CFT argument that you can use to do this factorization. And you see explicitly that the same thing happens at the three level. Here you have a set of momenta. Let me, let me call this, uh, let me say this is like one, two M. So we have particles one, two M here. So again, I have momenta K1, K2, da, 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 da. KM associated that, this, that you think is flowing through this factorization. And you can see just like at three level, that these are proportional to some other like parameter of this degeneration for this Riemann surface. So when this goes to zero, the scattering equations really factorize again. Did this one loop factorize into scattering equations at three level, 
for the sphere is scattering equations, uh, a one loop for the, the remaining torus. And that, if you know how, it, it, that's easy to see. There's like formulas on phi or any books, books on, on functions on Riemann's uh, surfaces where you can see how these kernels factorize. So that's good. That's one of the things that we were looking for. And there is also uh, a non-separating degeneracy, non-separating, which is when I have my torus, it's on mark points, and I take, well, I take the imaginary, uh, I take Q, which is e to the, um, the two i tau to zero, so it's taking the imaginary part of tau to infinity, and what happens is that I pinch the torus along one of the cycle. So this also, you can, you can see that this is more or less, uh, you go back to the sphere where you have two points that are, they are double point, they're identified. So you have a nodal point for the sphere, right? Uh, and what you find is that under this degeneration, the, scattering, the first set of scattering equations up there just go straight forward. They go to just this, the set of scattering equations for I sphere with n plus two mark points, but for special kinematics, because the last equation, once you, the last equation, so the equation setting p to zero, this gives me on that limit a q goes to zero, it gives me that L squared, which is the homogeneous solution to this P, is proportional to Q. So I exactly at the generation point, it's setting this uh, L squared momentum to zero, so you're looking at it. So this just becomes uh, the cut. So it's setting this momentum to be on shell, and that's what you expect, because then, then you really do have the, the, set, uh, scat, uh, the set of scattering equations for n plus two, a sphere with n plus two mark points. So that's very, very neat. It's, it's more or less expected if you have, if you have a, like a CFT that it, it's actually well defined. It's more or less expected that all this, this factorization property just work straightforward. All right? And any questions? So, so, well, very quickly, then, you can also see how, how straightforward it, it, it will be to, to just give a generalization for, uh, for genus uh, big, equal or bigger than two, because it's, again, this, the only thing you have, the only thing is that you have some meromorphic quadratic differential with simple poles, and you want this to be zero, everywhere, and for every point of light, for every, every surface of genus two. So straightforwardly, you know that <clears throat> for n mark points in, in genus G, you have uh, 3G minus 3 plus n moduli. So you expect 3G minus 3 plus n scattering equations. You expect n of them to be of the form uh, that the residue a z i of p squared of z to be zero, and you and you expect three g minus three of them to be of the form p squared of z a, let's say, to be zero, where a goes from one to three g minus three. So the same the same sense as, as one loop you expect. I'm going to kill the residues everywhere and all the mark points, and then I'm going to just set to zero the, the, the homogeneous solutions to, to the differential equation to P. And that is enough to set P squared to zero everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> while, of course, the, because of the, the equation doesn't change, is how you're always solving this equation. Because the formula of the vertex operators doesn't change, the action doesn't change, so you always solve the same equation, respective of 
uh, the form of the surface. So in general, you write down P of Z as a sum over, what do you want to call, call alpha, goes from one to G, L alpha, and then I have a basis of a billion differentials plus I, and then here I have a generalization of the kernel that, uh, that I, and then here some other Y. Right, well, this is the, I mean, this is the, 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 the propagator for the PX field. So it has a simple pole Z goes to ZI, and you, you have formulas for that, what it is. Right. Um, we've, what we, we've done, we've done with Tim is that we've actually done this, this explicitly for Genus 2 using the pure spinner. Um, also because we were interested in trying to get some integrands out of that, and the pure spinner is, is much easier to, to use uh, when, once you go to higher genus. But it's clear that the story should go more or less along these lines for, for higher genus, at least in this presentation of the scattering equations. Okay. Well, I have a question yeah. on the door space. Yeah. Yes. Um, it doesn't really matter because once once you degenerate, so once once you pinch and, and you go to the sphere, these, these two mark points you can think of them, of them as being fixed by the SL2C. So it doesn't really matter where they are, right? You appear in your SL2C. So you can pick a presentation where uh, a local coordinates where when, once you uh, once you do the splitting, one point is at zero, the other is at infinity, but it really doesn't matter because you still have an action of that, so to see. How would it work in higher genus terms? I'm not saying points, it just doesn't matter which points you pick. I think in the end it shouldn't matter which points. If you try to... to uh, but then I assume it's more degenerations you're thinking about? Higher so, a, a high, so a higher genus are more degenerations, um, but everything... But so, there's really one more degeneration where we have to be a bit careful when looking, uh, and that's one is a, a genus two, which is uh, this degeneration. Uh, um, and you see that, I mean, for the scattering equation, the scattering equation is just, again, just tell that the, the, the moment of flowing is on shell and, and the counting just goes straight forward through. So the point is, if you do it, so if you, if you do it, if you start with a set of scattering equations and, and from them you start doing the degenerations, you're going to have to work a little bit hard and, and not hard, it's just it's a bit messier than if you just look at how the word sheet factorizes. Um, because what you can do is that you can look at how, how you have to change your gauge fixing um, and, and how, the, how the vertex operators for the gauge fixing uh, distribute on the worksheet before you're doing the correlation function. That's the easier way of doing this, this degeneration. Imagine in this example, I degenerate both handles. Yeah, so you, you, you cut them. Points. Yes. Now it matters whether it's or at least there's one cross ratio. There is one cross ratio, but you, you still yes, have one model. You have, well, so no, if you don't do this, okay, so if you just, if you just do this, okay. If you do this degeneration here, uh, and you do a double degeneration such that you pinch these two guys, I'm not going to be able to draw this. Let me, let me pinch. You want something like this, right? So you can you you can see explicitly. Uh, so what you've done here is you, you've set what t one one to zero and you set t two two to zero. Uh, but here you have an extra moduli, which is the cross relation of these four points. So if you look at uh, how this 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 is, you have this double point, and in terms of the, the, this Riemann surface, you still have the tau one two moduli. Uh, but that, this moduli is something like proportional to 
to the log of the cross, cross ratio of these other points. So it's still there. So this, this, so this model I, of the Riemann surface is still there, but it it's now becomes a cross ratio. So, it's still, so the position matters in a sense, but not, not really because it's really the cross ratio that, that matters. What's the field in interpretation of the two surfaces? What L's are moduli are moment of the beam is greater than one. What's the meaning of this moduli? Modulus. Ah, that's a good question. Um, um, I'm not really sure. So that, that's one question that I've been thinking about because since like, this work by Lionel, Yvonne, and Ricardo, last week we've been thinking about exactly what is the interpretation of that. And I don't have much to say. I'm just thinking about it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how, how, how things represent that moment. Uh, if, even even if the putative the scattering equation that will be associated to this model, I, I'm not exactly sure what is the scattering equation that I want to use for that in, in this case. But we are thinking about about it. But it, it, it's really, I mean, we, the team and I have a, 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 an explicit uh, calculation within the period spinner two loop. So it's just a matter of sitting down and, and, and maybe redoing the calculation for, for that and see what, what comes out. Yeah, but sorry, I can't, I can't answer the question right now. All right. Um. So in the last five minutes, I'm just going to, well, tell you what, that if you go home and look at a paper, we do the calculations in the, the, the ambitious string. You get some expressions for them for what would be amplitudes at one loop for gravitons in this case. And the way that they look is there's an integral of the zero momenta of the field P. You have an integral over the moduli space. So let me write this as d tau uh, i dz i's to n. There's, uh, well, let me put this to, to, so I already fixed one point. Uh -huh. I have the scattering equations for the residue at z i of p squared. I have this equation for p squared at some point. And I have some integrands, one loop n. And that integrand for gravity, uh, what you find, it's a bit complicated because you have now to take into account, and since we had fermions, we have to take into account the spin structures of these fermions, you still have fafions, but those fafions now depend on the spin structure of, of the fermions. This beta, and there's some partition function of a beta. Uh, so you have some GSO projection, pretty much like the string theory case. You have to deal with spin structures. Um, at four points, you can, you can sum up. So at four points, you have something which is actually very simple. There's an integral of the moduli space. I'm just going to write this as mu 1g. And then you have the scattering equations equals to 2 to 4. There is u of the i p squared delta p squared. That's a naught. And that's it. And so what, what the work for last week by uh, Lino and collaborators showed that First, we, ha we had some evidence that this is actually, it actually reproduces the, the, the sum over boxes for supergravity, but what they actually showed is that they actually solved the scattering equations using um, the integration by parts on the moduli space and showed that this expression really reproduces the sum over boxes with, with some shifts, but it's still the sum over boxes. Um, and what has always been a bit of a, well, what was the, a bit of a, a, a stumbling block in this approach is that these are not simple functions to solve. These, these have some theta functions, and then you have some other functions here, more, more theta functions with characteristics floating around. So it was always difficult to see how we we're going to get any kind of uh, rational function out of them, or e even solving them was, was not necessarily have to solve them numerically, or unless you were in very, very specific kinematics. 
And so it was a bit of a stumbling block that now is being slowly starting to, well, with this new proposal, it's, it's being uh, overcome. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is that if you want to go, uh, there's also, there were some issues with, well, model properties of this integral, I don't want to go into details, but in this new approach is also, is, is that's a non-issue. Um, if you want to go to higher uh, genus, it's advisable to do something like pure spinners. That's the work with, uh, with, uh, with Tim, where we calculated uh, both the, using pure spinners, we, we recalculated this amplitude. Well, there's, a, there's an R to the fourth here. There's, a, there's some tensor structure here, T8, T8, R to the fourth. So we, we've redone this calculation with pure spinners. We also done the calculation with pure spinners for, for the two loop one at four points. Uh, and you have the expression that, as you expect, um, field theory, if I recall, there's some numerator factors, there's two loop momentas, P, the scattering equation, there's measure of genus two, then there's the scattering equations, one, two, four, I squared, then you have three, for the three moduli, a uh, delta of p, p squared is a, for the three moduli, and then you have this function y squared, which is more or less the string theory integrand. It's basically the string theory integrand, also two loops. Um, we checked that, I mean, this, this factorizes a field theory amplitude, that we expect it to be a field theory amplitude, and I think now, uh, but still, we still have the same problems. You don't have a sum of spin structures, where you have theta functions floating around, you have this moduli space, which is more complicated now to, to worry about, and how to solve these equations, uh, numerically is also challenging, even at four points. Uh, but um, the structure is still there, everything factorizes correctly, and then now Yvonne is going to tell you about uh, a, new, uh, a new proposal for the scattering equations that comes out of these scattering equations by, by doing it, uh, using residue theorems on the moduli space. I'm going to the moduli space. That's it. No, 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 no. What I, what I, so because it entails solving the scattering equations, so what I can, what I can do is, um, I haven't shown this equivalent to the double box. What you can show is that it factorizes a field theory amplitude. So if you try to do the cut where, um, if, you if you try to do this, where you separate the two tori, if you do, for the, there is a factorization channel where, where you, you try to cut this, this, this two right here, where this is not zero for, for, the string, uh, for the string amplitude because you have some uh, massive states uh, passing through, but we see that this is not there for this amplitude just because of kinematical reasons, and, uh, which you is already expect from, from if you have the supergravity from the double boxes. But we haven't been able to show that they are double boxes, and I guess that the, the easiest way to show this is going to do this, this kind of counter deformations. What about the other string that's factor? You know, when you look at the kind of one of the loops and show reduces. Um, I don't remember. The other cuts, I think it reduces to, we haven't checked them because that, the other cut is, uh, this. I mean, you can show, you can show it as a simple fold. You can show the factorizer correctly, but because this cut here, you have, you had four points, six points, you have a six points one loop amplitude, and we haven't calculated in this formula what it is. So but you, could, you can pinch both of them, and then show that what you get in that limit is a rational function. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, so somehow the, the, the one loop story covers those degenerations, more, more or less, at the, at the level of the loop. Yeah, so you can, yeah, you can look at all the boundaries of the moduli space, and you see that if you cut everything, you end up with a rational function or a three level one as you expect. And in fact, and this is the only one that we, we could get something like, but we didn't expect any massive modes, but we just, we did that. But I think a proof that this is actually a double box will go more to, uh, in the same lines as, as what Lionel was doing, Lionel's group is doing. 
because really solving this, 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 this scattering equations is, is, is tough. Even numerically? Numerically, you can do it. So, but the, there's, a, there's an issue with, um, with modular, there's an issue of how many solutions, and there's an issue with modular invariance. And what is the actual, uh, at one loop, what is the domain that you're looking and looking for solutions? So you can find, a, uh, you can find if, you, if, you look, if you use the whole strip, for example, then you find an increasing number of solutions that stays here near the bottom. And you, think, oh, you might think, okay, fine, I'll, I'll just stay in the fundamental domain, but then you don't find solutions in the fundamental domain for some kinematics. So there is an issue of exactly where should I be looking for solutions on that. Yeah. Like more obscure. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, is there a way to reduce the symmetry? Is it possible? Um, or do you have to have maximum success? Uh, so the only, the, this, uh, these worksheet models that we have that works, so we know how, how to define a, a higher genus, is, is maximum supersymmetry. Um, it doesn't mean that, well, given the scattering equation, you couldn't just guess something that has it's less, less supersymmetry. Uh, it really depends, yeah. I think the point of the scattering equations, at one loop, it seems that they, all they give you is just these n gons, and then you put things in the numerator to, to draft them down. So it really depends on what you want to put in the numerator. But a higher genus starts becoming difficult because you have to be careful with modular properties. So it's, it's easier to guess if you have something that's on the sphere, like, like the one which tells you. I don't know how to do, the, in this formalism, I don't know how to do power counting. Well, well, uh, I wonder, uh, well, I wonder you surely do because you know, understand the mapping. Yeah, no, uh, 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 one loop I do. So a uh, one loop, yeah, so that's why we think that we know that if you just look at the scattering equations and nothing else, we get this, this N gons. Uh, what's, but, the power, what's the power that loop them in the numerator? Let's say it's one loop. Uh, in the numerator? Yeah, in the numerator. So just the power count Oh, I, you know, without any processing. Well, so not, oh, I, uh, without any processing, I have to think. The thing is that, that there's some explicit loop momentum that appears on these Fafians, yeah. but then you have, but then when you solve the scattering equation, this, I mean, the Fafians are also dependent on the points, and those points depend on the loop momentum, so I, I really don't know exactly how to, how to do that power counting. Well, it would be good to know. Yeah, I haven't thought much about it, so. Yeah. Yeah. 